Hello everyone and welcome to the Avid CNC live stream. I'm Sammy and I'm joined by my, which way, this way, co-host co Corey. And we're thrilled uh, for y'all to be here today. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from and if you're working on any cool projects this week. Hello everyone and welcome. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, how's our audio? Uh, let us know in the comments there if we're sounding good or if we're more importantly not sounding good. And yeah, really excited to talk to the young makers today and share their story and also just talk about digital fabrication and education and um, all sorts of CNC stuff. So really looking forward to this conversation. So yeah, let us know where you're coming from and uh, let's let's go ahead and bring bring the young family in and I'll introduce them. Super. Here we are. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to, to chat with you. Hey guys, how's it Hello. going? Hello. Good. So uh, you guys are known as the Young Makers, but it's you also have first names, right? And so it's Stuart and Deanna and and uh, uh, the boys, Colby and, and Brody, right? And uh, but generally speaking, on social media, you guys are are known as the Young Makers. That's right. Yeah, mostly um, what we try to do, um, we try to you know do projects as a family. Um, you know, try to find content that, you know, everybody is interested in. It always goes better when everybody's got some kind of interest in the project. Um, and a lot of our stuff is just stuff that, I don't know, kind of fun projects or things that we want to do for around the house or something. Um, so we like to keep it light and fun. Yeah, well, Sammy always says that making is a team sport. And I really feel like you guys not only just take that to heart, but also making is a family vacation and, and uh, a general path towards your family bonding. And so can you tell us a little bit about kind of your making as a family journey? Yeah, I mean, the the boys have, you know, so we have um, a custom cabinet shop. That's what we do for work. Um, and so the boys have been in the shop since they were very young. This has been like their second home. So, um, you know, we work sometimes very long hours, seven days a week, whatever it takes to meet client deadlines. And so, you know, the, the boys have grown up here and, you know, kind of tinkering around with things, um, learning how to use tools safely and um, really more importantly, you know, respecting the shop and, um, and the equipment in it. So, um, you know, we were just recently um, reminiscing about how when the kids were young, they would take a box of screws and a piece of wood and they would keep the them busy for hours they would just screw a million screws into a block of wood and they were so proud of it and then the second part of the project was you know all right now go take all the screws out you know but um i mean that's really how they got started you know working with tools and it's just kind of progressed over time into them helping out with projects and um and now they they've got all their own projects yeah, and so I know you guys have access to a lot of different tools. Um, Stuart, where did you learn how to use all those tools? How did you get started, you know, getting into a cabinet shop? Uh, I just buy them and figure it out. <laughs> I only get them when I need it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, survival. That's, um, and especially today in, in, in today's in, in industry, you can't, uh, it, you can't run a shop without a CNC. Yeah, so what year did you learn how to program CNC's? Oh, geez. Uh, I think we bought our first CNC maybe like eight years ago or eight or nine years ago, I would say. Yeah. Um, probably somewhere. Yeah, probably somewhere around there. I, uh, yeah, eight or nine years ago. Um, but I spent a good amount of years before that self-learning uh, AutoCAD in preparation. Uh, yeah, digital fabrication, you know, CNC machines have been around for, for quite a while and it's just, you know, really in the last couple of years that the accessibility has really come to, you know, uh, the market that it's in and it's especially showcased here with, with uh, Brody and Colby in that, you know, they've grown up with a CNC machine around and their comfort with digital fabrication, I feel it is uh, really inspiring because I, I think the next generation uh, is gonna feel a lot more comfortable with digital fabrication just because of that accessibility and, and, and uh, uh, availability. And so 
Uh, Brody, when when do you recall your first time programming and cutting with a CNC was? Do you remember your first project on a CNC? Um, I don't remember the first thing um, we did, but it probably was along the lines of where I actually started to like learn like all the steps like in detail. It was probably like programming like our cutting boards on it and like to cut like the uh, juice screw. Mm -hmm. um, and then like I got a little annoyed because I couldn't always run the CNC when I wanted to. <laughs> so then uh, me and Colby uh, made and sold off cutting boards to purchase our own machine. And now we've upgraded to the Avid and it's a pretty good upgrade. <laughs> yeah, you guys have one of our benchtop standard machines there and love watching you uh, process. You know, I've seen you process a lot of different materials and different types of projects. And so, um, Cool. And then what's the, the CAD CAM program you typically like to use, Brody? Um, I use uh, Vector Aspire. Um, it's just sort of like when I was initially like looking to like get one, get a CNC, um, that software, it seemed like it had like all the features that I needed um, to do basic stuff and then to grow and do more complicated things. So that's why we don't do it. Yeah. Colby, do you remember your first project? Uh, I was making a skateboard with my friend. We like, um, we got, I think it was plywood, and then we did cardboard it. Yeah. Do you still have the skateboard, or did it did it find its way into someone else's hands? I don't think we finished it, but I we were, I was gonna give it to my friend. Well, that's neat. I think I'm, I'm wondering, you know, because during this last year, uh, it's been a very unique last 12 months. And while I'm not a kid and I'm not a parent, I'm really curious on how, uh, you know, like taking more time in the shop or uh, what that might have looked like for you in terms of getting to integrate that more and more into, I mean, it's been part of your lifestyle for years, um, do you feel like you've been able to inspire other kids to uh, integrate this as like a part of their curriculum or their lifestyle? Yeah, so when we, when COVID first hit, we, um, you know, we made it a point to say that we weren't going to change our schedule much. And so we, you know, well, a lot of their friends were sleeping until 12 o'clock in the afternoon and you know, kind of relaxing. Um, we we got the kids up every day, and we just said we got to keep going. Was, so their school initially had kind of just shut down for a while, and then we did start back remote learning last last spring. But it it was it wasn't it wasn't a great setup because the schools were you know kind of blindsided by the whole situation. So so the boys spent a lot of time. I mean, last spring they came to the shop every day. We got up. We got got ready for work and school and they came to the shop and um, so you know they were getting really creative with they had to, to to fill the time and to find different projects to do um, and now this year is a little different because they actually have stru more structured learning <laughs> to some extent right it's still not the same as getting on the school bus and going every day but um but you know they they have you know spent a, more time than typical um, in the shop. Um, I think Brody's Brody's first week of COVID, he made um, a segmented yeah, vase yeah. with more than two hundred pieces of wood. I like calculated it afterwards, and he's like a guy that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, and then, and then, you know, sharing those stories on social media and, you know, with their friends and whatnot. Um, and most recently, um, for those who've been following along, we've launched this program with our youth center um, to do a woodworking class with middle schoolers. And so one of the things that we did for that class was we brought in um, kind of like little pieces of projects that the kids have done over the years to show these kids, you know, all of the different you know, mediums they can work with, whether it was 3D printing or epoxy work or Colby's getting into leather work recently, um, woodworking. And, and we've spread out this table and this array of projects that the kids have done over the last, I don't know, five plus years, um, really to, and just like you're saying, Sammy, to inspire them and show them that, you know, if you just kind of put yourself out there, 
and um, try to learn something new that we just try to show them all the cool stuff that they can make. Yeah, no, I think you guys are really inspiring. Um, and those different medias, I think, can really uh, spark different uh, ideas and, and different projects to make. And so um, when we talk about all those different tools, uh, I, I do want to touch just based on kind of uh, maybe Deanna and Stuart, your your attitude towards safety in the shop and and tools that you, you, you know, will really promote um, youth for using and maybe tools that really promote a lot of supervision for using and kind of what that looks like in your shop. So you're the trainer, so <laughs> so so I uh, I I run a uh a BSC uh, uh black table C and C and um I'm running it for use and uh I I do everything that I can um on that machine and uh, I even do uh, styling rail doors on the machine. I I don't run a shape. I haven't run a shaper in um, I, I'd say yeah, I don't use even uh, even the joiner. I, I I only run it when I have to. Um, so I'll soft blacking solid wood. I, I I do everything everything possible on the CNC because of the safety factor. Uh, I will, uh, I, um, it, it just scares me. I, I've had too many, you know, employees that, that have, you know, been injured from, in, in, in previous, you know, jobs uh, that, um, you know, I, I've just seen it in, in, this, in the CNC, the digital world, it, it, it's safe. And, and it, it's really um, why and, and how we were able to put this program together was because it was uh, the youth program was because it, it, it was um, designed around yeah, the CNC and um, the, the safety. And, you know, it's very difficult to, if you say, you know, woodshop program for the youth, like all of those words just don't belong together. And, and, and people don't understand that um, you know, workshop today is is with the CNC. You know, we, we don't uh, we, we're not training kids to um, run a table saw or a joiner. You know, everything is everything everything possible is to be done um, on the CNC for the safety and the future. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. The CNC takes the cutting tool away from the person, right? You, you don't have to be engaged with the material and the cutting tool all simultaneously. It also allows for uh, an additional step um, that, you know, it is really promoting success and that, you know, you can have someone kind of check your work before you hit the green button and then you can watch that together and um, really make sure that, you know, you're operating the CNC in a safe manner. And, and so, um, when compared to some of those other woodworking tools, I, I, I totally agree. It, it, it's, it's a really safe endeavor. And so why don't you guys share a little bit about the, the project that you're doing in that class? Do you have that sample available, Brody? Yeah, yeah so um, I'm not sure. I made an uh, example. I'm not sure the way that ended up. But uh, I made this uh, little storyboard on the Avid, and uh, it just goes through all the steps. I don't know how close I am. So we start off by doing a glue up. So that's step number one. And then we uh, planed it flat with the kids. And all the kids were able to design and cut their own uh, custom uh, engraving on their signs. And so some kids did like ski, uh, ski mountain logos, other kids did their names. They were able to do that and then fill it with total boat epoxy. And we use the fly cutter on the Avid to uh, cut it all flat, and then we finished it. So that's a little storyboard and just an overview of the project that we did. No, and it was really cool because um, so we started out with only six students, um, you know, for social distancing, and it was the first class. But you know, the first day we kind of got to know some of these kids, and you know, and. Most of them had never been in a wood shop before. 
um, or even use any tools for that matter. You know, maybe they've, they've been tinkering around a little bit, but for the most part, this was their first experience working with any of these tools or, or um, doing any kind of project like this. And then over the course of six weeks, you know, they were able to, um, you know, learn some of the basics, you know, doing a glue up and, and using some of, you know, the, the safer basic tools um, they loved, you know, using the software and, and seeing it, you know, seeing their own design come to life while it got cut out on the, on the Avid. I mean, like you, you just watch them, like it, you could just tell how much they were enjoying it, you know, and then they got, cre got to get creative with, um, you know, with the total boat epoxy, which was kind of nice. So the whole thing was, um, you know, I, I mean, really exposure to a lot of different things in one project and over the course of six weeks I mean you could see the the sense of pride when the kids left the last day that they were you know really excited to go home with their their own plaque and show it off yeah I bet no it, it, that's a really fun project it's very similar to a, a workflow I use when I do some uh, sign making and so when you guys surface that epoxy did you end up recessing your V-carve, initial V-carve toolpath down into your material a certain depth, or were you just trying to surface that epoxy directly at uh, the material height? Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So I use a vacuum pod. It's um, a piece of press uh, pod. It's a really dense plastic. Um, <laughs> product. Um, yeah, yeah. Polymer. And so I have a vacuum pump, and I have a hole drilled um parallel to the flats and then perpendicular so um and i have gasket around it so that just creates a vacuum seal and um that pod allows us to secure um their sign to the pod and the bed of the avid um without having to screw into it mm -hmm. so um i initially tried to um just use the touch plate and um touch off to the surface of the material. But what I think happens is with the fly cutting, um, with our fly cutter, it like pushes down and the gasket compresses a little bit. And so I wasn't able to cut to the surface and I ended up cutting a little below the surface. Um, but that was not a very big deal uh, because um, we have, we uh, the V-bit we used was a, uh, 30 degree V bit. So even if you cut down a little bit, um, the change in width of the design was not visible um, much at all. So if we use a 90 degree V bit, I think it would have been a lot more uh, prevalent. Mm -hmm. but it was all right. So I was yeah. Happy yeah. So one trick I use there is I, I actually change my start depth to like 0.06. And so I am I am accounting for a sixteenth uh, uh, of an inch, or, or you could use whatever number there of material to re be removed at the post processing step. So my V carving is actually recessed down into my material a little bit. And so then when I do do that fly cut, and uh, I can get those corners all absolutely perfect because with V carving, that that depth of cut is what gives us the the perfect corners and ratio of alignment. Uh, uh, sometimes we've had boards that are twisted or warped and sometimes those letters don't look correct because the V-bit is exiting the material uh, at an inconsistent height. And so um, that's one trick that I've used for specifically epoxy filling and then surfacing. Uh, so Pete cool. uh, Buin here has a uh, compliment. He says he commends you all for uh, teaching and for sharing. Um, he was wondering, uh, Brody, if you like how you engage with your friends about using the CNC machine and about the things that you make, and uh, if you have any like-minded CNC buddies, which I think you do. Um, I don't have a lot of friends that are into this stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my only friend. Like, just... <laughs> and um, yeah, um, but um, my Instagram's there. A lot of people in my school know about it, but there's not a lot of there's not any kids in my school that sort of like have the same interests. So it's just sort of like to the maker community, like thank you for uh, <laughs> giving me a sort of outlet to like make friends and like talk to people about this sort of stuff. Um. And yeah, I can, uh, 
I have like conversations with people about it and yeah. Well, that's the power of the community though, right? I mean, because, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's so easy to connect with people, you know, across the country, across the world, whatever, and to, um, to, you know, connect with those people and find people that have the same interests, even if they're not going to the same school as you. So, um, being part of the maker community, I think has really, um, impacted all of us over the course of the last, you know, three years since we've really discovered it. Yeah, I've seen you guys. I almost call it like you go on maker family vacations, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and uh, it's 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 absolutely phenomenal. So we do, and it's and it's a blast. So you know, when we um, in the past when we you know go down to Atlanta for work BenchCon, um, luckily it's always fallen on school vacation week, which would have been now because they're on school vacation week this week. Um, which is hey. crazy to think, right? We would have started today. I know. Um, <laughs> So, you know, so typically we'll make a side trip, you know, so one year we went to Savannah before we went to Atlanta, the other year we went to Charleston. Um, and, and so we do, you know, we, we make a, a maker vacation out of it. Um, and we also try to incorporate, so the one year we went to Savannah, we found a jewelry maker and we spent a day making family dog tags, uh, which was really neat because none of us had ever really done any metal work then and, and jewelry work for that matter. So, um, so, you know, we're always looking to have that exposure to different trades and meet different people who are, um, who can teach us something, you know, because as much as we have to share, there's so much more out there that um, we still need to learn. Yeah. Just adding, uh, the first year, I forget if it was going to the Vanapony Airport or back to Atlanta, but we went to, we were able to, um, Jay Bates at the Rockler Oh, right, right. Yeah, so we found yeah. like meetups and, and Rockler events and whatnot. So, um, I don't know, we're always, we're always on the on the prowl to find something to do and somebody to meet. So, it keeps things interesting. Yeah, you know, I find that makers typically love to learn and they typically are very curious. Uh, I think that's part of what makes a maker, right, is, is a level of curiosity and, and a desire to learn and, and understand. And so that's really neat. And so um, looking at your guys' uh, demo project that you're doing with your, your youth program, it, it, it looks a lot like some of the cutting boards that, uh, that you guys make. And so can you talk a little bit about how uh, you guys have taken some of this knowledge about CNC and kind of turned that into a little mini business for the, for the boys? Yeah, I mean, they, um, so it all started with a cutting board that was made for me for Mother's Day a few years ago, um, you know, and, and I shared that on my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, and, um, you know, before long, we were getting comments, you know, where can I get one, can they make me one, I need a gift, um, and so we found a local um, artisan market that was just starting up. And we said, you know, give it, give it a try, go and see what happens. And, um, and they were a huge hit, you know, um, the, the feedback really, I mean, everybody loves the story because, you know, they're, they're young kids. So this was three years ago. So at the time they were only eight and 11 years old. And so, um, you know, they, they went to a fair and of course, you know, Stuart and I are in the background, you know, trying to let them do their thing, but you know, everybody was like kind of approaching Stuart and saying, oh, you know, these are really beautiful. And he's like, well, I didn't make them. The kids did. And, you know, and you, you had some people who didn't believe it, yeah, you know. Yeah, that we were basically like, guys, just like leave. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, go wait in the car. <laughs> they like kicked us out. They were like, leave our booth because you're like ruining this for us. People are believing our story. But, you know, as they were talking to people, I mean, people loved that they were young kids, you know, they were making things with their hands, um, that entrepreneurial spirit. And on top of that, all of the wood that they use is all um, scraps that we would have otherwise thrown in the garbage. So they're upcycling at the same time. So um, between all of that, you know, I mean, I will say that they got probably a good amount of sales just based on their story alone. Like people felt like they could not leave the booth without supporting the spirit of what they were um what they were doing yeah, I, wasn't <laughs> well, I mean that's fantastic the story is really what makes your cutting board different from anybody else's cutting board and uh that is a you know that narrative really can um 
you know, people want to share it. People want to be able to connect with the handmade thing and have a reason to, um, you know, invest in that and just and have a good reason to support you and, and you being able to share that with confidence, say, mom, dad, go, go over there. I'm, we're, we're doing our thing. I mean, I was blown away by your, uh, both, you know, uh, Colby and Brody, your, uh, confidence and ability to, uh, share all of the processes that you do. I was very impressed because I'm sure, um, you know, as CNC is becoming more integrated into most shops, you know, so a lot of, Adults don't have CNC machines in their shops, and the fact that you could speak so eloquently about CNC and fabrication and, and your processes, I was like, wow, you could do a lot of things a lot of adults can't do. So it was just very cool to see that and to hear and to speak with you about it. Um, yeah, a couple of folks in here are mentioning, yeah, they when they got to meet you, it was such a wonderful opportunity, and they enjoyed it as well. So um, how do you feel like that is... Uh, I guess for the boys, how do you how do you feel like it's outside of learning how to make things? How do you feel like this um, endeavor has really helped you grow? You know, as you're kind of growing up and you're getting to interact with the community and help building a community. Um, really, how do you think that's impacted uh, you personally as you've kind of grown up through this? I'll go first. All right. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I think it's like, I don't know, I feel like it's impacted my confidence a bit. Um, because just from like uh doing the cutting boards and like getting in front of people and just like having to talk like eye to eye somebody and like sell your product and like whether it's just like telling them about it or like don't sell it to them or like even if some uh if another vendor comes up to us and starts uh one vendor at a fair, he came up to us, he also sold cutting board, and um, I think we did a little better than him, and so he was like, he was like very angry at us, and he was like, did you do your market research? Because, I don't know. Very unprofessional and, yeah. and unsportsmanlike yeah, behavior. But it's just overall impacted my confidence to, for one, uh, be able to talk to people more like fluently and like maintain eye contact, and also just like at school, people are like, oh, you're the wood kid. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> all right. And yeah, go with you. And like for me, I've been able like, to, if I'm like scared to try something new, this will help me with that. Cause if I wanted to do like leather work or metal work or welding, I could just go and do that and try it. And I really can't screw up that bad. So <laughs> I could just try it and it might go well. That's, those are both really excellent life lessons, right? Is that, you know, getting over that fear to try new things because, you know, a lot of us, me to include it, are scared to try things because you don't want to be bad at something. But if you never start, you'll never get good at it, right? Um, so that's a very good lesson. And, and the confidence of just being able to interact with people and build relationships, I mean, really great life lessons and... Um, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I mean, we always talk about how, you know, failure is necessary and it's, you know, you're not going to know something the first time around um, and you just have to, you know, you're, you're going to mess up and that's part of the learning process. And um, I think being in the shop and seeing that with certain projects, because we have had some projects go awry at times, yeah. <laughs> like our more, first epoxy pour. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot more failed projects than <laughs> successful ones, but yeah, nobody hears about them, so just as <laughs> well. We all, we all do. Or they, or they do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all good. Awesome. Um, uh, who, someone here in the chat is asking um, the boys, uh, what project have you been most excited to have made? Like what project that you've made is the one that you're, you're like probably the most proud of up to this point? I was really happy and excited about making the big skateboard. <laughs> I love that video. Uh, that was, that looked really fun. Yeah. Uh, for me, I feel like it's always like my next project because like, I don't know, like some of like, I want to say this earlier, but um, 
some of my like older projects I've done, like when I made the arcade cabinet in like seventh grade, like I thought that was like the coolest thing. But now like looking back, I'm like, wow, I could have made that like, so much better now. <laughs> and like, yeah, so it's just each project I do, I'm just expanding my skill set into different things and just learning and growing. And yeah, so the next project's probably gonna be better. So well, if you look at many of the channels of makers uh, in our community, you'll see them make the same project three different times, you know, maybe once a year or once every other year, and show each iteration of that project and how it gets better. And also, you've done a lot of uh, prototyping, like in your um, uh, pocket knife series, which was excellent. And I love getting to see in the series how you work through problem solving. Um, you know, when you had some difficulty with the drill and the tap and how you overcame that, um, how you uh, really thought through on your work holding and your fixtures for different types of operations, um, particularly when you were talking about the brass machining, you were going into about how you were, you were doing some test cuts to figure out uh, the ideal feeds and speeds for the router bit that you had uh, from, you know, uh, I think for bits and bits, you know, and you're like, okay, well, I want to really dial this in and figure out what's the perfect step over, what's the perfect plunge rate and pass step then. Um, how do you feel like uh, you've, I guess, what, what is the best process for you in terms of problem solving and how you work through uh, prototyping and design to come up with um, uh, your final build? Yeah, so um, everything always has to start with just like, a generic idea in my head or something along those lines like for example like the brass machining like i uh i watched a few videos on youtube about it i watched um winston makes his video on brass machining um and his settings were a lot more conservative than mine but it was just a starting point it's like also with the pocket knife i like drew it out like um i have like in that drawer right there I have just like a bunch of like plans. I think I sold like the plans for the vase. It's just like an 11 by 17 piece of paper, just all the things drawn out, like my idea for like the accents and everything. And then uh, from there, I have an idea of where to start. And then I'm just able to just, where whether it's prototyping, just keep adjusting it until it works or figuring out how to run new speeds or feeds in the machine. It's just, uh, getting a little more aggressive and then like like I mentioned in the video um using your um making observations of the piece the chips the if the bit's hot everything just to dial it in so you're able to cut to um the maximum capacity while also not like killing your machine or your bit so uh I I uh... I won't sell you, not just me, but, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time um, uh, teaching about failure and um, how you have to fail to succeed. And, um, you know, um, you know, failure is good it, 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 it's, it, 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 as long as you accept it. Um, that's how you learn and grow. Um, Brody, you know, was pretty hard on himself, you know, early, and until he, um, you know, he, he would Brody would come to me for answers, and I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I've never run, I've never cut brass on on a on a CNC. I don't have the answers. Um, so I think I would give him, you know, he, he would. I think we would uh, break a bit and, and I would, you know, tell him to order three more. And he's, I don't need, <laughs> I don't need three more. I just need one. I said, well, you're going to break the first one and the second one, and then you can use the third one. And then, and if it's Sunday, you'll be able to work. So, you know, the, um, the failure, teaching the failure early was really, really um, crucial to getting yeah, and I feel like another thing, just to this is a little unrelated, but sort of ties in. Um, 
I sort of like, I usually like go at a project like really hard at the beginning and then like, I, I enjoy it, but I sort of get like burnt out with it. Like all my big projects, this happens and it's like, the arcade cabinet, my guitar, the, the pocket knife, that, that <laughs> too. Um, and I just take like a, like a very long break from it. And then I come back to it and I finish it, whether, whether I've like learned new skills or anything just to like, and I come back and finish it. And it's like, it's just a much, I'm much more satisfied like with the project. Um, well, you Usually come back because, with a fresh perspective. Yeah, too. and I also, like, if I fail a few times or screwed a few things up, it's okay because I come back with a fresh, like, mind, like you said, and then I'm able to reevaluate and, like, go back at it. Like, I remember with the guitar, like, I got the kit for my birthday. I worked on it for, like, two weeks straight, and then, like, I took, like, a two-month break, and they came back to it, like, the end of summer vacation, like, wrapped it up in the last week. And, yeah, it's the same thing with the knife. I was going at that for, like, four weeks straight and now I'm, I'm taking a break. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, I think, yeah. you know, it's interesting how you were talking about how you're learning how to learn. And this is a really important uh, step where you're figuring out what's the best way for you to get better at something and even figure out where to start, right? Like watching Winston's video is a perfect place to start. I mean, that's where I would start if I was, you know, wanting to learn how to machine brass. Um, and then learning about the variables and learning about how to adjust it because it's never one size fits all. Like your project is very different than Winston's project. So, and your material might be slightly different, uh, a different alloy. So you have to make some micro adjustments and you're using a different bit, but those foundations are the perfect place to start. And um, you're kind of growing from there. Uh, are there any other tools that you kind of reach for when you're trying to learn about new processes? I mean, other than just like basic woodworking tools, like I try and do the majority of them on the CNC. And um, if I can't do it on the CNC, then I sort of like think about like the different ways I could do it. And then, yeah, I mean, for other processes other than CNC, um, I don't know if this ties well, in the question. Yeah, I've been uh, working on learning how to weld. Um, I think I can weld big pretty good. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've also been trying to learn TIG welding here and there, just sort of learning another process. And yeah. I mean, it's funny. I, I reach for the CNC for pretty much every project too, so I don't blame you on that. Uh -huh. But uh, I, I guess maybe, I'm sorry if I didn't form my question perfectly, but is there, um, like, what are other ways you like to learn? Like, you look at, you find videos and examples, and also when you were talking about uh, when you went to Savannah, uh, learning from the metalsmith, learning different processes, uh, learning in person and learning online, and you've created this uh, course uh, for students in the youth group. Is there... Um, particular things that you took from what you learned about how you learned and tried to implement and share that uh, with those students as well, like the hands-on learning um, and different ways to kind of communicate and teach them uh, when you're in that space as well. Because I know when I was growing up, I'm a very uh, hands-on learner, but it was a very text-based learning um, program that I grew up in. So. Uh, you, you have a better understanding of like diversity of different types of learning styles. And um, do you feel like you were able to kind of share that with this, the kids in the youth group as well? Yeah, so, I mean, there so, are so many different learners in the, so you know. The, the big, one, one of the biggest things about um, working on and with the CNC is that it truly is very easy, but you have to break a, the barrier down um, from somebody's perspective that all that they do is see this, this, this com complex piece of machinery and a computer sitting next to it. And people's, you know, their, their minds are blown. They, they you know, um, you have to break that barrier down and uh, I watched Brody um, do that with the kids 
in the class um, by doing by in, engaging the, 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 the kids in the class to get on the computer and 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 do you know their their, uh, their line drawing or even just even the simple things just type type your name into the computer and then watch the machine run that you know um, that was really good because it, you know the, the, the students they, you know they were just their mind was blown that they can type on a keyboard and produce something yeah. on a machine yeah well sort of adding on to that another thing i wanted to do is i just want to get them using the machine like sort of just getting comfortable with it like as much as possible so it's like i would be holding the probe on the piece of the material and i would tell them to jog the machine um just so that they get more comfortable and, and make the connection between hitting the arrow keys on your keypad and watching the machine move and then I want to be able to cut out uh, the design that they were also able to create in the software. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you guys more. I, I call it the wall of intimidation when people mm -hmm. look at the machine and it's like, there's no way I can climb that wall. It's way too tall for me. But when you can break it down step by step, especially when you have a program like this where you know the success is pretty much guaranteed i call it like a ladder so when you can put a ladder on that wall and, and you can do it one step at a time just like you're saying brody hey jog the machine right okay now jog it up now hit this button and that's going to probe our, our, our z-axis to the touch plate when you can break it down into individual steps it removes that intimidation and all of a sudden they're on the other side of the wall and they're like holy cow i i did it i cut it on the cnc and then it's teaching them how to kind of make their own ladder or, or make their own workflow where they can get successful cuts off the CNC. But I always say, hey, it's best to, you know, have, have a mentor, have a teacher or copy someone else, right? We have tutorial programs for different uh, projects. And, and I always encourage, hey, if you're really intimidated by a CNC machine, run this simple project three or four times because it's going to build a lot of confidence in the different steps that you need to do to cut successfully and then once you're cutting successfully it's just different shapes different tools is there any future Fantastic. upcoming projects that you're really excited about that you want to share um i mean i think our biggest project is um the next chapter to this youth program so uh, we did run into some roadblocks along the way um you know, uh, from the, the, the program itself ran fine. Um, our insurance company did not appreciate us having children in our shop. So um, we um, were told that we have to form a new legal entity to do that. So we are um, incorporating young makers to do that. So that's another point. It's uh, always good when something bad comes. <laughs> Right, so I guess you can consider that a minor failure, but we always work around it. Um, we're always making lemonade over here. So, um, so really, our next big project um, is getting getting our program really up and running, um, and we're going to be working with uh, hopefully another youth center as well. We have another local youth center that wants to uh, to get on board. So um, that's really consuming a lot of time. Right now between um, regular work and the kids in school um, and this and this program, we've been spending a lot of time kind of um, not so much in the shop making, but doing a lot of this preparation yeah, work. Yeah, the back end work. Um, but we're really excited because, um, you know, since since the program, we've gotten calls from all over about people saying, oh, my gosh, my, you know, my son likes to do this, or my daughter wants to learn how to do that, you know, can you guys do a program for that? So um, we've heard back from the community at large that, you know, it's something that they really want. And uh, so we now see it that, you know, we're gonna be delivering that service to them. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. I think that's phenomenal and, and really just, sinking into that as a goal and just saying yeah we're we're, we're going to do this and we're going to go all the way and so that that's fantastic i and i think there's a, a a desire for those types of programs when we talk about engagement and especially when we talk about just the amount of 
screen time that you know all of us, not just our youth, but all of us are are, are doing right now, um, and being able to use our hands and build things and 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 learn skill sets. I think there's going to be a continued need for for those types of programs. Definitely. What's that? Oh, so, so here this, was a recent project that we did. This is an average, all, all average. Well, that looks great. Oh, can you guys see it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's all um, all done on the average. It's again another family project. Yeah, that rooted out of COVID because we've had Taco Tuesday every Tuesday since last March, um, <laughs> which is a good thing. But, um, you know, we've always said, oh, you know, we sit down every Tuesday and we're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had something like Lazy Susan with all of our sides so that we can just flip it around. Everybody can get to the cheese without saying, can you pass the cheese and all that stuff. Um, so that was, you know, um, a relatively easy project. It really didn't take much. I think, was that a weekend project? Yeah, well, give or take a weekend project. We, we had to like buy, we bought all new fancy bowls for it. And like we had to order a taco, a tortilla warmer off Amazon. So that was cool. And then, yeah, we prototyped it on the Avid and then we cut it out of some bamboo and then just did some cosmetic work. And yeah, taco tray. It's an awesome taco tray. It's the best taco tray. Yeah. We have to provide our dining room table though, because when we turn, everybody's got to lift their plate, where we have to set it up high a little bit. But, uh, but um, you know, and that's one of the things that you know I mentioned earlier. You know, just out of need, like if we're just sitting around, we're like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have that? You know, and then and then it's cool that we can come into the shop as a family and kind of put our heads together and and come out with something really beautiful like that. That is very cool. That's awesome. This one of my favorite projects Perfect. I've seen on, on your channel for sure. Awesome. Well, if there's, is there anything else y'all would like to share or uh, Colby or Brody about any last words of wisdom for kids out there who are interested in getting into making and um, anything like that you want to share? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just go do it. Just go pick up a tool and learn. Yeah. Start with uh, well, a thousand screws and a board. <laughs> that's called these little mantra is think it, make it. So, um, you know, the, and that's what you do, right? Super. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you everyone in the chat who joined. And um, this was fantastic. We'll have to have you have you all back in the fall with some follow-up projects and to hear about how the program's going. Yeah, we would love to share that. Thank you. Super. Thanks everyone. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.